Yeah, feel free to unmute yourself when you want to answer. I just muted everyone's screens for now or everyone for now because we can get a lot of get a lot of feedback and background noise is happening. Okay, so I'll do the Ixnakwa song one more time. Ixnakwa, Ixnakwa, si echkola sucha, si echkola sucha. Anna ich golaskins, Anna ich golaskins, ich squelas, ich squelas. Ich snakwa, ich snakwa, si ich golasuxa, si ich golasuxa. Anna ich golaskins, Anna ich golaskins, ich squelas, ich squelas. So I forgot to mention the beginning, the, the beginning part is saying good morning or it's a good morning. That's what ich snakwa means. Si ich golasukha, are you doing fine? Anna ich golaskins, yes, I'm doing fine. Ich squelas, goodbye, or until we meet again. And then, I'll be sharing my uh, video screen here to share um, a video tutorial that our coworker Ab has put together to help understand the vocal track map. Now, um, for those of you just joining us, we've decided to uh, move forward with um, a very specific way to represent our our language in the written form, and we're we're going to be utilizing the work of M.M. Bach, uh, the work that he's done with a lot of our elders throughout time. And the reason, the shortened version and the reason why we would like to do that is because it's the most easiest uh, to, to interpret and to learn from. The other orthographies, those are the ones that you'd see using the small little circles and the Vs, and, and those are really problematic for, for beginner learners. So anyway, um, Ab has taken it upon himself to study the language and study M in box orthography and all the orthographies across to kind of help us figure out which one is best suited to our learning needs as a community. And he's recorded uh, extensive videos that will help us understand that rep written representation of our language. So I'm just gonna share my screen and I'm gonna pull up the video and we'll watch that together as a group. And then we'll allow for a question and answer period from everyone after. Oh my gosh, Parker, you're so cute. <laughs> I don't know if you guys can see Parker. Hi, Malia. Okay. Mm. Oh yeah, I wasn't. Can you guys see my screen? Yep. Okay. I also have to make sure you guys can hear it. The last time I played it and there we go. I played it without and you guys couldn't hear it. Can you guys hear it? Anna. Okay. Anna. Perfect. I am Ab, and today I want to talk about the vocal tract. So here you see a side profile of, your, of a human head. And this is basically a detail of the vocal tract. And these are basically the parts that are used to manipulate sound. So we're going to start with this part here. So this is your tongue. It's a very important part of your vocal tract. It's involved in most of the sounds that you make. It changes shape, it changes position, that changes sound. 
Um, here we have your teeth. So these are your lower teeth. These are your upper teeth. So the sounds that are made involving your teeth usually involve closing them slightly. Um, we'll look at some examples of those in uh, videos that will follow this one. And then here we have your lips. So you have an upper lip and a bottom lip. The sounds that are made using your lips are referred to as labial sounds. And basically labial, labial is just another word for lips. We have up here, so this is your nostril, and that means that this is your nasal passage. So the nasal passage is involved in some of the sounds that we make. Sometimes there's sounds that we make where you're pushing air just through your nasal passage, then comes out through your nostril. Sometimes sounds come out partially through your mouth and through, an, through your nasal passage. But any sound that involves your nasal passage is referred to as a resonant sound. So resonant basically means that when air comes up through your nasal passage, it's resonating. The sound is kind of bouncing around inside of your nasal passage and then coming out of your nostril. This little area right here, I'm just going to draw a dotted line. This is called your alveolar ridge. So this is a little bump behind your upper front teeth. There are some sounds that you make um, where basically you take the tip of your tongue and press it up against this ridge. Those are basically called alveolar sounds. Sometimes your tongue gets close to it. It doesn't quite touch and the air comes out through your alveolar ridge and your tongue. This is a pretty important part to remember. There are some sounds that are specific to high Slakiala that involve your alveolar ridge. There's, uh, there's sounds that you don't hear in English that involve the alveolar ridge. And this area here, if you take the tip of your tongue, press it up against the roof of your mouth right in the middle, this is called your palate. There's actually two parts to your palate. This part right here, if you take the tip of your tongue, press it up against there, you can feel that it's pretty firm. So this is called your hard palate. So there's some sounds that you make where the air comes up, bounces off this area, then comes out of your mouth. So those are called palatal sounds because the air is being directed off of your hard palate. This area here is also sometimes referred to as part of your palate, but its proper name is the velum. So the velum is basically your soft palate. So if you take your tongue 
press it against this area here, you can feel it's a lot softer than this area, which is your hard palate. This here is called your uvula. So this is basically uh, a piece of skin that's hanging from the back of your throat. This area here is called your pharynx. So it's basically the part of your throat that's that's, um, that goes up into your mouth and your nasal passage. So it's this, this area here. This is called your larynx. So another word for larynx is voice box. So your larynx has vocal cords. The way you produce sounds, most of the sounds that you, you hear, air comes up through your trachea here, your windpipe. They pass through your larynx. The larynx has vocal cords. Those cords vibrate. That's what creates sound. It comes out through your mouth or through your nasal passage. Those are called voiced sounds, the ones that you use to create sounds where your vocal cords are being engaged. This area right here is called the glottis. So this is the opening between your vocal cords. So there are sounds in high cycala that you make by closing your vocal cords and then releasing the air. So those kinds of sounds are called glottal stops. So if you hear anybody talk about glottal stops, that's what they're talking about. The glottis is the opening between your vocal cords. You make a glottal stop by closing your vocal cords and then opening and releasing that sound. So that's a look at your vocal tract. This gives you an idea of the different parts that are involved in making sounds. In the next video, we will talk about vowels. Until then, exquilas. There are two types of vowels used in high Sakella. So, um, <clears throat> I'm going to unmute. Um, I believe there is a raise hand feature on here, I think. Or if you want, if you have questions, you can um, ask Ab any questions that you might have about the, the vocal tract. I know it can seem a little overwhelming when you're going through that and you have all the different descriptions, but you'd be surprised at how much of, how much of, what he's talking about you actually are you, you probably already know or are aware of like when he was talking about like a glottal stop um words and stuff like that uh and is one of those glottal stop words because you're taking a pause and that noise comes from your glottis <laughs> yay i'm learning <laughs> i'm learning right along with you guys so um Please don't feel shy or anything like that about where you're at in your learning. Um, that's what we're here to do together is to, is to learn. So I'm gonna unmute and if we could just um, take turns asking questions, if, if you have any questions for Ab. And welcome to all the new joiners too. We have quite a few with us today. Glad you could make it. Um, so yeah, does anyone, anyone have any questions for, for Ab about the vocal tract? It does get really extensive afterwards, and I'm sorry I don't have a word list today. Um, I don't want to overwhelm people with all the different terminologies and things like that. Um, but I would advise you to, if you want on your own time, to take a look through the videos that Ab has shared, he shared them in order in ways that would help people learn. And um, last week we kind of just dove into alveolar sounds and and then Ab informed me that there was a, a method to the way he wanted 
um, or would advise people to learn uh, the orthography. So <clears throat> I didn't include words for this week, but um, examples that I can give that were based off of the vocal track are uh, labial sounds, sounds that are made with your lips, uh, babao. I'll just give examples that I think people are familiar with. Babao, mamao. See, those are noise, those are sounds that are made with your lips, also called labial sounds. Avular sounds. Um, Alveolar. 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 My highs the accents way too strong. <laughs> ah, violer. <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> They'll pronounce it like highs the words. <laughs> okay. Well, one word that's a alveolar word that you might be familiar with is nuqua, which means I or me. <laughs> Can you hear me? Yeah. Um, I like how um, you're, you, you're showing us words that utilize um, those areas. It might be more helpful for me to understand where and when to use them if we use them when they were pointed out to us. Like when Ab, Ab is saying, Ab is showing us this area and telling us that we use this in um, certain words. Maybe an example would be helpful at that time. Okay, are you guys comfortable to review, um, what was it, regular vowels? That was the video that came next, right, Ab? Yeah, um, I do want to say something about what I was thinking when I was started recording these videos, was to basically just start with showing like the mechanics behind speech. Because I found that in my own learning, uh, learning how the sounds are actually made has really helped me a great deal and has led me to where I am today where I can I have a pretty good understanding of the written language and I'm learning more about how it's spoken. But that was really the starting point for me was to learn how the so sounds were made. So what I my plan behind making these videos was to start with that, start by introducing the vocal tract, different parts of your, your mouth that you use when you speak, and then describe different sounds. Um, I have a specific way of grouping them, like vowels will be covered in the next video. There's actually two types of vowels that I, I talk about, and then consonants. But for these, this first stage, uh, it's a three-stage system. So this first stage is basically where I just talk about the sounds and I use English words as examples. And then the next stage, that's where I actually plan on using highs words as examples. So it's um, that's kind of the overall idea that I had was just a really gradual progression. And um, I just kind of wanted to make things a little bit easier for people to understand. and. Since we're all familiar with English, we all speak it. I figured it would be good to start with English examples for different sounds first, and then move on to highs the words. And then from there, start talking about how words are built and sentences and things like that. So that was kind of my plan behind it. So uh, in my series of videos, highs the words will be coming up, but it'll be at a later, later time. Um. I got a, a question for Abs. Mm -hmm. I think he's the one who's showing iPhone. Um, I, was, I was looking at your word list and the sounds that go with it. I think it's the one that um, came after uh, Megan Metz's sound, the pictures and words. But I don't know what glottalized, is that how you say it? Glottalized? What does glottalize mean? And what does 
I'm sorry, I didn't get all of that. Your audio is kind of cutting in and out, but the, you asked what glottalized sounds are. What does it mean? Yeah, what does glottalized mean? So your glottis is the opening between your vocal cords. Yeah. So in a glottalized sound, what you're doing is you're closing your vocal cords and then you're releasing the air. Can you give me an example? Like the example that Teresa gave, uh -uh. Uh -uh. there's actually two glottal stops. There's one at the very the start of the word that you can't really hear, but you can hear the second one. So you say, ah, and after you make that ah sound, you're kind of closing your vocal cords and then you're letting out unt. Ah, unt. Just doing that, so, you can feel it and you can hear a little bit of wind. Ah. Yeah, so, so that Hi, pause, Maria. That pause, that's a glottal stop. Okay. And what, thank you for that. And what is popped? What do you mean by popped? Popped is, it's like a regular sound, but it's more pronounced. Like, uh, like a regular P is like in the word pop. But, oh, it's uh, where the, the emphasis comes, eh? The kind of louder? It's, yeah. So like a, a glottalized P is a sharp, it's, it's just more pronounced here. Uh, so it's a glottalized sound, so you're closing your vocal cords, you're kind of building up air, and then releasing it all at once, so you make more of a puh, puh. sound. And there's other consonants that are kind of like that, like T, the regular T is just tough, but a glottalized T is tuh. So that's oh, kind of what I mean by up, You tighten this whole thing up. I think so, yeah. Okay. Gotcha. Am I, uh, would it be right to say that ala is a popped sound? Ala? Yes. Ala is work. Ala. Uh, what is, uh, what was the other one that you just gave an example of? Uh, a bomb. A bomb. A bomb. A bomb is fern roots. So those are examples of those popped sounds. Anybody else have any questions for Ab? Um, I think we what we'll do is we'll share in preparation for the next class, maybe some of the guides that Ab has created to go along with his teachings. I think that will help to have those visuals in front of you as well um, with examples, because that's where I'm kind of reading off of those there's this really handy guide that App has created here. I don't have a digital uh, ready, ready copy for it, but you can see he's categorized it and organized it by words and by which words are associated with those various sounds and where those sounds come from according to the vocal tract map. So this one's really helpful guide because it shows you where, where they all come from. That's where I got the example for the, the, the glottal sounds for uh-and and hate moss. It really helps for, especially those of us who speak English um, as our first language to know where the placements are um, and properly say the words. Trying to unmute you. Did you did you send out the first one too? No, I'll make a note of that so that we can email. Because um, I have tons of notes in mine, like from when Ab told me every I told talked about everything the other day. Yeah, I have. <laughs> it's funny. I have all the versions with me too, but I still I don't have a, a digital version yet, but. Um, um, I think the one that, um, the ones that are updated on abs is, I asked him to put his name on the bottom. All these resources can be found on our HiSec LL website as well too. Ab has uploaded and shared them on there as well and under resources. So you'd be able to find all of these there as well. I found the picture of the guy's head, but all of the names that you attach to different pieces, I didn't find that. I think this is his updated one. Okay. 
Um, the other thing, I really like it, Abs, that the, the, you're explaining it by the, um, how it's mechanized in your mouth and how those, each of those parts of your mouth, the way you move your tongue or your, your tongue against your teeth, your back of your teeth, or this, it makes way more sense. Because I, I don't understand all the little um, squiggles around the, the letters. That doesn't make any sense to me, but what, what you're saying makes way better sense. Yes. Oh, thank you. And that's, that's kind of what I'm hoping is that um, by presenting lessons like this, people will start to associate sounds with those symbols and that'll make things easier. Uh, I'm hoping that people will get to a point where they can start to kind of do that on their own. They can see like uh, an X with a line over top of it and they'll know what that means or uh, the little raised W, things like that. So. I think that's kind of what I want to, uh, the direction I want to go is to explain the sounds that go along with those symbols and then hopefully make people understand that, make it easier for people, for people to understand that. I've caught myself uh, going through the vocal trap map video and I was feeling with my tongue along the top part of my mouth, feeling where the hard palate is, a soft palate. And then I forgot, I'm like, oh geez, I hope can't see my screen because I'm sitting here kind of spacing out doing that. But I, another example I wanted, because I think we have, we all have, you know, bits and pieces of our language that we've heard over time and we, we know or are familiar with it. But one that's, um, that requires the use of your, I believe it's your hard palate from the video is Jahwan. Jokhwan is another example. Um, Tsimoza. And if you say Tsimoza, just pay attention to, to where those noises are, where there's friction happening in your mouth, because it will help understand as we go along, I think. And like I said, I'm just learning myself too. So I really appreciate the videos that kind of break down the mechanics of it because it helps me understand. Because I'm always missing the proper pronunciations. Um, and yeah, it's antivira. Yeah. Okay, are there any more questions before we, we move forward? We will have a larger focus on language, um, uh, like with word lists and stuff prepared for next week. Um, I just figured that the vocal track map is a pretty overwhelming piece altogether, so I didn't want to keep diving deeper and deeper into it because you, you could go on and on, but the way app has the videos uh, rolled out, you can literally just play one and watch the rest. And maybe that will be, that's your, that's your homework assignment is just to take a scroll through those videos to get more familiarized with it. And then maybe afterwards you can start diving into more word examples. And uh, I think with those videos, it will really help you understand where, where and how to create those, those words. So any more questions before we move on? And drop a message in the chat or hey sorry sorry because this is my first time on um I, i'm just assuming that you're talking about the videos that are on the heislik ella wordpress site yeah they're available on there actually maybe what i should do is just show everyone where you can access heisler resources for one um, it might be helpful to, to show where you can find all of these things. So I'll just share my screen again and I'll show you guys. Gosh, I have so many things open right now. YouTube. So wordpress.com is where you'll find all of our resources all in one. Scroll down. 
Here's uh, older Isaac L. Learner, learners group, Wordless, Learner's Journal, all the lists of our gatherings that we've had. There's videos, language lessons one, two, and there's some other lessons there as well. Resources, commonly used Heisek Ella words and phrases. You can see them broken down by categories into language, greetings, family relations, days of the week, months, and numbers. Heisek Ella language packages, Heisek Ella sounds and spellings, links, and HTML symbols. I'll just open this one up quickly because I wanted to share this with people who are interested in typing out Heisek Ella. If you go to HTML symbols, App has done this very like, useful tool here that shows how you can spell it because currently we don't have an updated keyboard to type out our, uh, our language. So this is what he's made up in place of that. And if you have the Heisla language dictionary, this is where it will come most in handy is to spell words there that you might want to share there. Where do you get those dictionaries, Teresa? We have a digital copy. We can email them to you. Um, and when we're allowed back into the office again, we will be making more copies of them. Um, we're trying not to roll out too, too many copies of them because it is a work in progress to update them to reflect our, um, our new orthography. Um, or to build on it, I should say. Video Thank you. I don't know if we're quite connected. Oh, yeah, it is. Under videos, it will bring you to our YouTube page. And then here's where you can find all of the videos that we share. I'm not sure if there's a current upload of what we have reflected on the WordPress website, but if you just go to our page, it will show our lessons. And I haven't uploaded my newer videos to the website yet. I was planning on doing that sometime soon. See, and then ah, look at that. Yeah, there you can see all the different videos that explains all more, expands on the vocal um, map. And there's also homework there with uh, word words there as well. Oh, wow. Yeah. And this is only like one, one playlist. There's, there's plenty of other videos and lessons to be found on here. Okay. Holy smokes. Yeah, this is, this has been up since we've started. So, um, there's a traditional plants and trees. There's a lot of older lessons that we've had from when we first started. So you'll see the older Heisek Ella Learners Group lessons there as well. There are some TPR lessons that our education staff have done with Minnie and Vera. There's days of the week in Heisek Ella, months of the year, other words and phrases. A recommended watch is uh, Gil Anuch, Canoe Mountain video. This is, um, this is a video that shows and talks about the way we would tell time. So yeah, those are those are examples of our and where you can find our lessons. Thank you for that. Um, oh, I'll also show you one more resource that's really helpful to know about. Um, SoundCloud. If you go to SoundCloud, we also have accounts on there as well. Um, and it's just under a high And you can see there's Isaac Ella account. There's also a second account. Come search. Isaac Ella and Isaac Ella too. So this is where you'll find um, exercises, like a first course in Heisla, Ulla can harvest in Isaac Ella. We sneeze Heisek Ella and let's learn Heisel lessons. So there's more additional lessons there. Uh, what I like to do with SoundCloud, because I have this app on my phone, I play 
my SoundCloud app on my phone and I connect it to a Bluetooth speaker depending on where I am. Sometimes it's in my car and I'll play it in my car. Uh, other times it's just on a speaker at home. So those are some additional resources that you can access from home and continue your learning efforts from home. Okay. Well, we just wanted to like kind of share overall a, diff a bunch of different things uh, while while we have everyone together. So. Um, Additional to sharing language resources, we wanted to share some stories. And uh, this week, last week, we shared uh, the story of Watmis or Hunkukulas. And this week, we're going to be sharing, um, we'll be sharing the story of Jesse. Um, Dustin, do you have the document with you? Which one? Sorry, no, I don't. No. What is it? I just get tired. I just get tired of story you just see. Um, maybe yeah, I've, I've got, yeah, I've got one. Okay, well, I'll start with it anyway. Um, it's okay, man. Um, Okay, well, we'll be reading uh, the story of Jesse from the Tales of Kitimat book compiled by Gordon Robinson, the late Gordon Robinson. Um, in case you don't have a copy of this book yourself, you can purchase it at the Kitimat Museum of Archives. They, they do keep a lot of copies there with, in, in their gift shop. So I'll just kick off by reading it. Jassi. Assi. Sorry, I pronounced that wrong. Jassi. Jassi lived in a village called Klunk in what now what is now known as Alaska. His family lived in Klunk for many generations, and because he was eldest of five brothers and five sisters who helped him in tribal matters, he was the chief of the beaver clan, the strongest clan in the village of Klunk. The sea had been given his name by his father, a member of the Eagle Clan, and the name meant Eagle Claw, Eagle's Claws. The large family of 10 brothers and his sisters loved their aged parents and each other devotedly. And the death of both parents within a short space of time caused the young people so much grief that they felt they would never again be happy if they continued to live in the place which reminded them continuously of their grief. This overwhelming sense of loss caused C and all his brothers and sisters to decide to uproot themselves completely and leave to seek new land where they could forget their bereavement. Shortly after the funeral, the family left their village and paddled their canoes southward with no particular destination in mind. At night, they would camp in some sheltered bay or beach and on one bright shiny day, they camped on a wide sandy beach and when the tide was low, they started digging for clams and cockles. While the others were digging clams, Faust, one of the brothers, went wading where the water was shallow. He saw a small octopus enter its lair under, the, under a large boulder, and he reached under the boulder to capture the octopus, but he accidentally stuck his hand into a giant scallop, a clam-like creature, securely attached to the rock. In spite of all of all his and his brother's efforts, Staus could not remove his hand and the tide came up and he was drowned. When the tide had receded, Jesse cut off Staus' arm and cremated the remains and kept the ashes in a small box. 
After this added tragedy, Tassi and his party continued their journey and after some time arrived at the Nista village of Kinkola on the Nass River. They were welcomed at the village and stayed there possibly a few weeks. Guda Hayek's one of the brothers married a Nishka woman during their stay in Kinkola. The Stuart family in the present day village of Kinkola are the descendants of Guda Hayek. After leaving Kinkola, a sea presented, presently arrived at the Simshian village of Port Simpson. Here he was again welcomed and made a short stay. This time, in Siptik's, a sister married a Simshian and left the party. Today, Alfred Dudeward of Port Simpson traces his ancestry to Isiptiks. I apologize if I'm mispronouncing these. Leaving Port Simpson, Tassi entered the Skeena and followed the river until he came to the village of Kitsilas. Welc welcomed again was extended to the travelers and Din Din's aunt, another sister, felt so welcome that she married and stayed. During their stay in Kit's last, there occurred one of those apparently insignificant occurrences which strongly influenced destiny. To see captured a little squirrel, which proved so easily tamed that it soon became a pet. He attached a string to the, to the squirrel and it would precede him when he walked. Having heard of a lake where fresh water mussels were available, to see decided to visit this lake. So he and all his party struck out overland with the pet squirrel in the lead. The squirrel led them straight to the lake, now known as Lake Else Lake, and there to see pitched camp. It was a clear, warm day when to see and his relatives went to gather mussels at Lake Else Lake, but the fair weather and the shores of the lake reminded him of the other day and that other beach where his brother had drowned. He took the wooden container of Stouf's, Stouf's ashes and set it on a log on the beach, sat down and wept. While they're weeping, even the sun and the supernatural forces or beings seem to feel compassion for them. The whole wor world darkened as the sun went into an eclipse. When the sun had come out of the eclipse and for no apparent reason, the container of stouts, ashes rolled off the log, scattering its contents on the beach. This unexplained phenomenon was only, was only the forerunner of many others for there appeared on the surface of the lake a gigantic beaver, Huthek, amidst a large patch of foam. A halibut of unusual, unusual size appeared in this freshwater lake. <sighs> a quak quak, or large whole man-like being, was seen in the lake. The upper portion of a man's body Holding an otter was the last object which Jassi's relatives saw in the lake. When these unnatural objects had all disappeared, Jassi decided to leave the lake at once and with all his relatives followed the pet squirrel which led them overland to the Kitimat River. They followed this river downstream until they came to the village of the Heisla, situated at the time near the mouth of the Kitimat River. Here, a very warm welcome was extended to the travelers, and after they told the story of their journey, they were invited to join the Chaisla tribe. When Jesse accepted this invitation, he was presented on behalf of himself and all of his brothers and sisters with a large community house called the Kelp House by the Blackfish clan as a welcome gift. Jesse and the remainder of his brothers and sisters soon settled down in their new home and married Chaisla people. His ability as a leader was so apparent that he was soon chosen as a chief of the Chaisla, and he kept his name to see, but in addition, he also called himself Pugay, meaning overland traveler. And to his brothers, he gave the names Kuthek, giant beaver, Kwakwak, Kwakwak, whole man, and Chamin, the names of some of the things which appeared on Lake Else Lake. All of the objects he had seen on the lake, he adopted as family crest and used these crests on a totem pole, which he had built for himself. The totem pole had two beaver on the bottom, one above the other, then a quak quak whole man, then a halibut, a figure of the sun which seemed to sympathize with him during his grief, and on the top of the pole he honored the pet squirrel which led him to his new home and happiness. <laughs> so now um, the last time we shared a story, I forgot to leave room for people to ask questions. 
Um, and I'll have to learn the proper pronunciations for all those names. So I apologize. I don't mean to offend anyone with my mispronunciations. But are there any questions or do you have anything you want to share about the story? Um, anything you'd like to add? Is there a general timeline around um, when he went about, say, found Lake Alts Lake like that? Or is it just uh, just a story without a date? I think it's just a story without a date. There's, there's no projected time, timelines with, with any of our stories. It would be interesting okay. to know, though. And the recent findings have confirmed our time here being uh, around 17 years. I got another one. <laughs> um, is there any recordings of w where the totem pole stood or any, any history behind that, where that totem pole ended up maybe, or if it fell back? Um, I, I imagine as, as all of our older totem poles do, they probably fall, have fallen to the ground and maybe thrown over. Um, but now that I think of it, the current totem pole, which is sea pole down by the point, I believe is a depiction of in honor of me. It's funny because I asked a question about, I asked a question to uh, Sam Robinson, the C, and I had asked him, oh, can you tell me the story of the totem pole? And he's like, you're going to have to come and sit with me <laughs> if you want to hear it. So, um, yeah, this is actually, I haven't read this story in a while. I had forgotten about it. But it would be interesting to find out where where the older totem poles were. Go ahead, Vera. Hi. That stood between our house and Fred Williams's on the front road. And when our house burned down, that totem pole went down. It was burnt alongside our house. It was so old it caught fire in no time. There was nothing left of it. That's the last time I know of a totem pole being in the village until they created these ones by the rec center and at the point. Wah. Whose house is currently there, Auntie? Your Uncle Morris is in uh, Lou Bolton. In Lou Bolton. Oh, okay. and, uh, Fred Williams, yeah. When our village was still one or two roads. <laughs> okay, that's that's really interesting. Any other questions? What year was of that fire, Vera? Do you remember? Hi, hi, Vera. Hi. Can you remember what year that fire was? 1965. May 5th. Wow. 1955, eh? <sighs> You wouldn't happen to know, Vera, who made that totem pole, would you? No. It was, it's not mentioned in any of the uh, articles I've read about that pole. When you go back in archives, um, anybody, if you can make note of who the carvers were during that time. Okay. I don't know if um, mums grandfather may, um, um, helped make that totem pole. Who was, what was his name? David Shaw. Oh, okay. Marshall's great-grandfather too. That's who David is named for. 
Yeah. There's, I think, three Davids in that family now. Yeah. Because uh, David Shaw, in his lifetime, was known as a carver and a woodworker in the village. He built houses and carved. Mm -hmm. Where there were um, everyday tools that people needed, like the halibut hook, the spoons for us, the feast bowl. I mean, feast spoons, things like that. Well, that that's what he called. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, we also wanted to share a little bit more information about plant usage. And um, I apologize to Dustin because last week he, um, we were supposed to do um, Devil's Club. And I switched it on everybody last minute. <laughs> I forgot that we were doing devils, supposed to be doing Devil's Club last week, but instead we covered, um, what, what is it, Oaksley, Indian Kilobor. So this week uh, we're actually going to cover um, Uikas. Uikas is Devil's Club. So, um, Justin, do you want me to do the same thing as last week, or would you just like to start off by sharing information? You and Auntie Mira can share. Some I think, yeah, we'll start this week so you can switch it up on us like last week. Today's topic for uh, traditional plants is Uikas Devil's Club. So I'll allow you to take it away, Dustin. Thanks, Sarah. And anybody else? Okay. Have Do you want to start, Vera? No, you go ahead. Okay. Um, so this is weak as bark. We harvest it from um, basically any time the the leaves start sprouting, you'll be able to harvest it. Um, I'll start off with a story, actually, I was telling Vera prior to this, Vera and I had a probably about a half hour discussion. <laughs> um, I got told a story from an elder when they discover a devil's club around our territory. And they, they were on a fishing party and they saw these splashes on the ocean. They went over to get close. And they saw these wolves taking these plants into the water and splashing around. So um, when the wolf pack left, they got interested. I wonder what those wolves were doing. So they went to where they where the wolves were bathing, and that's what they found was uh, Devil's Club. The wolves are bathing in the Devil's Club. Um, my assumption is to wash the smell of death away. Um, we use these for good luck. We bath in it for good luck. It has such an amazing smell. Uh, reminds me of when I was little, my grandmother had it for basically every bath at my grandmother's house. We'd be bathing in Devil's Club. We use it for kind of like uh, good luck, warding off. Uh, hunters use it to ward off their human scent. Trappers use it so it gets off their hands and when they're setting traps, they're not smelling human scent. We also use it um, basically for good luck and bathing to bring, bring what you want into your life. Um, for sickness as well so some of this is the best medicine when I get sick I take a piece I'm not sure how good you guys can see that that's just a piece of the bark and then I chew on it till the tip of my tongue gets hot I guess to say you'll feel the warmth of the devil's club and once it starts tingling that's when I spit it out I use that for asthma and I also use it to clean out my lungs um, one, one of these, as I told you guys last time with the duhua, this is an, uh, has astringent property. So what astringents do, we'll use your lungs as an example, your lungs sit in your, in your chest and the astringents tighten. So when you, you have asthma or bronchitis and stuff like that, as it starts tightening your lungs, you'll cough and all that phlegm starts coming up. That's a really great, uh, aspect of astringents. Uh, some modern uses are they're pulling out the roots these days, grinding it up in a mortar and pestle and eating it in capsules for rheumatoid arthritis. Um, we actually treated my girlfriend the other day. She has really, really swollen hands. So my sister and I 
grabbed a bunch of olive oil while my sister had olive oil and we infused it with the devil's club. We stuck the devil's club in a rice cooker with the olive oil and let that infuse for how many hours, Coral? About 48. About 48 hours. And then um, this probably changed five different shades. It was really, really light and that's how much, this is some of our number one grade. So you could take some of this oil and put it into your affected areas and it'll reduce the swelling. My girlfriend's hand looked like um, dimples where her knuckles were and probably about a half hour in, you could actually see where her knuckles raised back up. She gave some to Karina too. She's loving it. Yeah, we, we um, give it away for free, too. We never charge for our medicines. Uh. Yeah, I, have to, I have to say, too, that um, I got from Dustin and Coral, and I used it on my um, purple tunnel. My, I have a, something happened to my knee many, many years. The top has been, like, um, numb, and I've been using it on both of them, and they're just, it's just amazing. It works I'm really glad to hear that and yeah we for uh, things like that when we get called upon as medicine people I think it's our duty to do what we can um, I never charge for any of my medicine um, outside maybe food donations if people want to feed me I'll always take food <laughs> Thank you, <John. laughs> but there's a lot of um, there's little tiny when the shoots start coming out there's little buds on there it's really closely related to ginseng so when you take it the astringent properties it's also a diuretic too so once you start internally taking it you have to start drinking more and more water you'll know your body will ask for it because your tongue gets really dry so um, once you start doing that you'll start seeing your every every um, line in your hand that's the astringent properties are pushing all the toxins out of your sweat um, yeah if you see my sister right now she's actually Sick. fighting a cold Look We're how both. Pale I am. <laughs> <laughs> but she just boiled this down to bath in it today and in this there oh she's gonna drink that one i have one for drinking and one for bathing um, this one here, I actually infused it. You know how Sambucol is all the craze? Sambucol is actually the Latin name for um, Gacina. So we took the bark from Gacina the other day when me and Brody were fixing our medicines. And uh, instead of taking the Sambucol pills, we're infusing the Oikis with the Gacina bark so that it, it fights all cold and flu-like symptoms. So with this, it kind of pushes your symptoms. It's just like uh, pharmaceuticals in the sense that you're not going to just immediately feel better. Uh, it takes about maybe 15 to 20 minutes to kick in. So your nausea and the coughing, the sore throat, it'll, your symptoms will subside substantially for approximately five hours. So what I do is I just brewed some for me and Brody because she's not feeling well either. And we're going to have a cup of this, and then before bed we're going to have another cup. But if I were working, I would want to take this every five hours just to keep the nausea and my functionality up. So. And just while I have this here to show you guys, Vera was telling me, and I thought it was a great idea, I usually make mine um, when I bath in it or when I drink it. She actually makes hers like this and she jars it like that. So anytime you need it, you just crack the jar open. So that's what I was going to do today. <laughs> and prepare it ahead of time. So next time I get sick, I won't have to do this. I'll already have it prepared and ready to go. <laughs> Don't forget to seal your jars. Okay. Thank Maybe you. About 10, 15 minutes. Just till it pops. Okay. Thank you. I have a couple of questions for you, Dustin. Um, okay. Maybe you had a question? Yeah, what did um what did you mix with your um devil's club, Corley? She, that gray current. Acina. 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 Oh. It's a gray currant berry. Um, you'd hear the elders 
say they picked it at Butedale. So when uh -huh. they eat dairy, the first thing they're going to do is tell you all the stories. That's a great part about medicines is when you're reintroducing them to your body, like how many of you guys have smelt Devil's Club and you flash back to when you're a kid? Oh, I remember my grandmother telling me or I remember my grand bathing me. That's the best part about us connecting with our medicines. It keeps your mind fresh too. So when I would witness my grandmother and I'd go pick all the berries, I gave them all away actually. I don't fancy them too much, so I, I them. give them away to all the elders, and they all come back, and right away you can see their mind work, and they have all these great stories, which bring, really connects me to them, eh? Um, I have uh, a really good bond with the elders, and um, I'm the kind of person that's waiting for them to tell me stories. So a lot of people ask me how I, how I know so much. It's literally, I was a nosy kid who needed to know why. <laughs> Another thing um, is when you when you bath in the devil's club, can you just throw the like the what you had in your hand? You had the all yeah. Can you this just one? cut pieces of that and then just throw it in the tub, or do you have to? Yeah, use what, yeah, I bundle them up to the size. This is what I was taught when I was little. Um, I know my way is different than somebody else's way. Yeah. Um, basically, I'm just going with my teachings, um, right and wrong way, as long as it's dried, in my opinion. Um, depending if you're trying to use it for spiritual uses or whatnot, maybe maybe your mindset when you're harvesting. Uh, I was always taught to talk to the plants. Um, I'm harvesting you for this reason. I'm harvesting you for this reason. I don't do it open. Um, I talk to them in my head, and I'm always offering a piece of myself with them, right? So... Um, what, if, if what you're asking me is I take this a day before and I put it into a jug of water and I'll just let it right. And when you come back to it in the morning, it'll be basically your water will change to about that color. So then I add that to that, but you could also boil it for an hour and let it steep that way too. My granny used to say that, uh, that's what we used for our soap back in the day. We never had soaps like people from town had is what you'd always say so that's what we used in uh in place of any kind of soap is what she taught our family and mm -hmm. antiviral bacterial and antifungal properties so that's primarily the reason why we used it and also um i find that when you wear it especially before you go harvesting it keeps the bugs away from you oh wow. we also use um thimbleberry leaves and just rub that on our body and it kind of disguises you from the bugs and thanks Liz you'll have to unmute yourself I'm not sure it's not letting me do it for you hi <laughs> sorry about that here was um, <laughs> I was Here's wondering if that's the, what's that <laughs> Do it again. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Dad used to bug me because when he'd say something and I'd answer him, and whenever he would go right, I would <laughs> um, Question to Dustin and Corley What part of the, uh, you said you mix casein with the Devil's Club? What yes. part of the casein of plant did you use? Coralie uses um, the leaves. This one's the bark. Um, the bark, you could use the bark. Casein has different, um, it's kind of going to accent all the best properties of the Devil's Club. So do you want to explain? Sure. I'll let my sister explain so we're not trying to over talk to each other. So casein in this specific brew right here, this is the um, the bark. Just give me a second. I'll go grab it for you guys so you can see what it looks like. And then here's the leaves. I'm going to show them so the these are the there. leaves we just harvest. Um, we dried it up, put it in there. Also, the stick that I took, um, I don't kill my medicine, so it's still alive, but I stripped the bark off, and that's for um, what we use for is rapid healing of epidermal like your skin so if you have a little cut it'll really help help 
fast, but if it went too deep, your skin will heal before the inside of your meat. So your scar tissue will really would be really bad. So we would not use things for for really deep flesh wounds. But here's coral shoes. So here is the ink shark. And it uses just in like teas and also for topical, like what Dustin's talking about, mending the skin. And the tigo, uh, any kind of staph infection, any kind of bacterial infection, it helps with both internally as a tea or topically on your skin. We also use this, this, sorry. I don't like, I like to repurpose everything. So this right here is dried case and leaves. You can actually make jelly out of it. And um, we're gonna go pick some when we harvest and try our first batch with just the leaves. The beauty of this is you get the flavor of the casina, the berry, but you don't have all of the seeds that most people like to avoid. So this tea here is used for everything from for um, female health hormone regulation. So what I mean by that, it helps out with your fertility, but it also helps you at the time of menopause and for premenstrual cycles and endometriosis. So I use this specifically to treat PMS. Um, I use with endo, and also um, that's what I like to use the leaves for. But it not, it's not necessarily just for women. It also helps males regulate their hormone excretion too. But the reason why it's so beneficial for women is because our hormones fluctuate on a monthly basis with the moons. So um, I do brew this in tea as well. And um, it's really simple to fix. I don't know if you guys saw the pictures of me and Brody fixing it. We also use the flowers too. The flowers help you with deal with allergies, seasonal allergies. So we brewed some fresh case in a leaf tea and um, my allergy symptoms went from uh, completely unbearable to non-existent. So that's because you're taking the pollen and reintroducing it to your body and then your body is more quick to deal with interacting with it on a daily basis. A lot of uh, theories that you read about allergies is the food that we eat is very important because we're building our body to interact with these plants in our region. So when we're importing it and dependent primarily on import foods, we forget to rearm ourselves to deal with the pollens that are around here. That's good. <laughs> <laughs> Ole. <laughs> And they both taste really good. I mean, uh, if you guys are interested in trying some tea, I'm more than happy to share. Awesome. Thank you guys for that. We got There's uh, one, thing, one thing I forgot. We used to crush the, when the berries come up at the top, that's the best for wounds um, doing your hair. When we did the culture camp last year, I had the kids, we went to the hot springs. We had all our bark to bath in and our personal bark to scrub our body with. And then we all had our own berries. We crushed them up and I showed them the orange inside of the berry. We put that in our hair and it was just, um, until you experience it yourself, uh, you won't know what it feels like really. So anyone, once, that, once it comes out, I suggest everyone try it because it's so nice and it's so refreshing. Not only do you feel clean, but your, your um, soul feels a lot cleaner too because it is a cleanse as well. That could be something that we we teach the kids. Camps, right? Yeah. Out, out on the land. And Coralie and I are always available to anyone that um, you know needs a consultation. Uh, like I said, we never charge for our medicines. We give it away for free because that's who we are. But we don't mind food. <laughs> <laughs> and he likes baking. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Just to throw that out there. <laughs> I like to tell you know, <laughs> <laughs> um, One thing that brought that reminded me of uh, when our our staff we went out for team building out at Wewa, and uh, we 
they're all sitting in the hot tub that's there, the natural hot springs and the, the hot tub that's there. And Dustin comes and grabs um, Devil's Club and he threw it in the hot tub we were sitting in. But it was such a different real um, relaxation, like with the with the Devil's Club bark in the bath. It was it was something else. I really enjoyed that. Um, Another thing I wanted to bring up too, or maybe bring up as a discussion was that uh, Devil's Club was used to, for our cleansing, for our own cleansing purposes, like you mentioned, and specifically it was used for hunters to do cleansing, like um, Nakwalagula was our way of cleansing and doing cold water cleanses. But um, from what I've learned from uh, different elders, and I'm sure Auntie V will agree, as well is that uh, well I can't unmute NTV. It muted everyone for some reason again. So I'm gonna unmute. Okay, anyway, um, it was used for like cleansing ritual before going hunting, is what I understood. So Nakulagi was also a cleansing ritual uh, done specifically before people went hunting. Um, Fishing as well, when they're going on a long journey, they would do the same thing. And uh, yeah, it's pretty, pretty interesting hearing the stories from the old times to the new times. And that's what I really like is keeping, keeping that pure teaching. Uh, yes, I branch off in my own ways. But when I'm talking our medicines, like if I was to harvest Heisla medicine, I follow the protocols that I was taught. So, and when I'm bringing people out, I like teaching them sustainable harvesting on not how to kill your medicine as well too, because um, I'm not too sure if a lot of people are aware it's an endangered plant. It doesn't reproduce like many plants do. So when I sustainably harvest it, I can go back, let's say three years later and harvest that same plant again. And in my mind, the thing re remembers who I am. I give it an offering. I sing it a song sometimes. Sometimes I share the water. It depends on what I have and what I'm feeling and essentially what I'm going to use it for. I was taught to give tobacco, but that's a Khinasila teaching. Um, that's right. I don't know if it's Haisa too. But. The other piece of that too is that those cleansing uh, rituals were done in private. Um, and the example I share is that I grew up uh, not knowing that my dad and his brothers actually did this. Um, and that's how private it was. <laughs> I grew up not knowing that my dad did, the, uh, did cold water cleanses and things like that. And I just didn't know about it because it was such a private affair, a private occasion. So, um, you know, it's something to, I think it's definitely a teaching that um, does require reflecting on too, because I think when you go out there not knowing or, or familiar with the cold water cleanse and the intentions behind it, you can, you might, you know, you might be doing something else. And I think having Duho, or not having Duho, having Uikas with you with those cold water cleanses is, um, that's the way our people have done it. And from what I understand, it was to like, to get rid of our scent before going out into the, into the, the bushes to go hunting or or to go fishing on long journeys, like you said. Auntie, do you have any teachings or anything you'd like to add? No. No? Um, I was just reading through the Sanberry Blossom in the New Year book, and I was just reading what different elders have shared about the plant as well, and it's basically expanding on what Dustin and Coral have already shared about Devil's Club. And, um, it was just to get rid of, you know, bad smells. Um, Rick Maitland had shared, I use this mixture for an oral rinse for my wisdom tooth to help fight the infection in my tooth. Rick's recipe involves preparing a concoction with the inner bark of the devil's club and alder bark. So it sounds like a lot of the time, like different medicines were, can be paired together to, to utilize. Um, also been said that an infusion of the pounded leaves of Devil's Club can be used to treat uh, rheumatoid arthritis and the berries have been pounded into a paste and the extracted juice is used to treat sores or take, taken internally for gastrointestinal problems. 
Uh, Devil's mm -hmm. Pelvis also uses a laxative. Eye wash, respiratory aid for colds, and inner bark is applied directly to wounds. Um, we used to use and prepare a special ritual, a ritual medicine from Devil's Club and use it for purification, repelling enemy spirits, and also as a good luck medicine for gamblers, hunters, and fishers. The ashes have been used as a basis for face paint used in dancing and other activities. And an infusion of the inner bark was used with Oxley to purify the house following the death of an, of an inhabitant and perhaps to kill germs. Um, it's actually what I use to smudge in my home. A lot of the time, if I don't have sage, I'll light a small piece of Oxley and uh, a little bit of devil's club. I don't burn too much in my house. It's just a small amount just to kind of, you know, cleanse the air, cleanse the energy in my household. And I thought it was pretty cool you guys started talking about Gacina too. And is that the one that's known as a hairy berry? Or am I? Yeah. Oh, okay. No, the hairy berries are the ones that sit on the stumps close to the ground. They taste the same. They look almost identical. But um, what I know of the hairy berry is basically they associated with the smell of skunk. So in Isla, the only person I know is my Baba Taylor. I'm not too sure if Vera is aware of it. That works. It has to do with a, something, a skunky taste, the way I was explained. <laughs> they call it casina because it smells like the case party. Case party is an insect yeah. and it smells. Is that the word? find um, them when you're out in the bushes picking berries. Stink bugs. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> and well, they were called the case party. Okay. okay. That's where they got the name Casey now. Oh. Can you can you guys hear me? Anna. Anna. Those those um hairy berries. And yeah, you usually do find them growing around stumps, but in other places too. And we picked a lot of them as kids. Mom used to can them by the quarts. And it's um Mike's favorite fruit and jam. So I still pick it. And uh, they don't smell like skunks. <laughs> <laughs> Not really a skunk smell. Uh, but smell. I didn't realize that there were two okay. types of acina out there. Because the, the gooseberries, uh, the, they're wild gooseberries. And the ones that we pick, they're hairy. They're fuzzy. Yeah, those are hairy berries. Um, I have two different stories on that from two different people, and they argue on their story too. So I stay away and just call it a hairy berry. <laughs> That's what I call it because it, it looks like yeah. a hairy berry. The hairy berries are the ones that follow the ground and uh, stumps where the, the casina hangs over the river. And they say when you find a really good patch, the river will be here and all the casina hangs are over, and you just take it by the bundle. Oh, no, I've never picked on the river, but, you know, person. Mom used to take us, um, whenever we were very picking, which in the summer was every morning at 5 o'clock when it got bright out, 4.30, she would have, a, um, like, she had, she had great big buckets, right? And ours were, were cedar baskets. That's what we picked them. And she would have a separate bucket for us to put the casey night because she didn't want the big stuff. And those berries, when you when you eat them raw like that, it fills your mouth up right away. It's like eating a black currant because the currants are strong. So I don't know where you would find casey that aren't hairy. I um, actually was your sister that made me my last. Um, that so that casing a jam that you guys have up at that house is probably that I picked, and we find we found that in a real secret place in the middle of the ocean. <laughs> <laughs> we pulled our long line, and that's what we got. <laughs> Ooh. <laughs> yeah. I guess I'm gonna have to do some baking for you, hey Dusty. Yeah, well, we will take you guys out. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, so soon enough, I would really like to 
get more engaged and take people out. Um, I, I find it more direct when I'm, when I'm around people instead of trying to go, I'm pretty shy to go on camera. So this is still gives me anxiety. Hey, eh? when I'm in the bush and we're right there, I could have better free flowing thoughts, I guess I should say. It just flows a lot better for me when I'm in, in that element. Um, but like I said, if you guys have any questions and if I could help out in any way, I'm always available. I'm just a message away. Awesome. Thank you for that, Dustin. Thanks for your questions. Does anyone have any more questions? That was a lot covered just off of those two plants. We got two for one today. We covered Lucas and Asina. And I even learned about the hairy berry. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> but I was reading something again on the Salmonberry Blossom uh, book, and I, I thought it was really interesting about Acina berries, is that the root of Acina was used to induce child labor after an expectant mother had gone into false labor two or three times. Perhaps this, must, this medicine served as a muscle rela relaxant, is what it says. But it comes with a warning. It says this medicine was only administered with difficult labors, unless under the guidance of an experienced traditional medical practitioner, this must not be experimented with. But I you, know, you wouldn't think that something like a berry would have that kind of uh, property to help during child labor. I think it's the root. That's what she yeah, just the said. Root. Yeah, the root of it. Yeah. Yeah. The berries, uh, that outward powder. So when they're saying it's a um, gray current, it has a b outward powder. It looks like, um, what's that one? It looks like a cedar, but it's not a cedar. Juniper. Yeah. Juniper. It has the exact same color berries. Uh, you can wipe that powder off and that's for your internal. It'll help detox your uh, organs. Hey. Eh? So each prop, the Gaysina does something different for your body. But it's so interesting to me because a lot of it has to do with hormone regulation. Mm -hmm. um, the leaves do something different than the bark, than the berries, than the root. Each, each has a purpose that are linked, but... Who has those teachings anymore? Yeah, not I don't have any bird. teachings about the root, so I won't practice anything with the roots. But it'd be interesting to find out somebody who does, because I know there's got to be a knowledge holder that we just need to identify. You were going to say something, Minnie? I found, I, I figured it out. Sorry. Okay. I, I just wanted to go back to the berries of the Devil Club. I'm, I was really shocked to hear that you can ingest it for intestinal problems. Yeah. I always I always thought that they were highly toxic. No, well, that's the same thing. So when you were looking at um, you would, when you're looking at any Western medicine, um, the toxins in there, they say none of it can be consumed. But I used to drink a cup of it in the morning and at nighttime with my grand. So they say none of this shall be consumed. But we stripped the bark and used it for our medicines as long as I know them of you would, you would, they say is highly, highly toxic, but it holds a chemical in it uh, that they patented called Taxol and Taxol is what they use for chemotherapy. So like I said, I'm really curious. I heard about these rumors. I went and it's actually true. So that same chemical in Taxol, uh, Taxol, you find in uh, another plant that I'm going to teach later on, Yarrow. Um, these two hold the same chemical in there. Uh, Baba John, used to use the yarrow just for cuts and clottering really fast but the more i start researching that wow i'm just so many doors are opening up and like i said the longer you start with plants they're going to start teaching you as you go along too so don't think that i just woke up one day and thought i could do all this because i read it <laughs> uh, i've taken the time to get to know the plants and uh, know the medicines working with them um, the spiritual aspects as, as well as the respect for the land. Um, I'm always giving back and I'm always giving it to people that are uh, needed. One thing that we're very fortunate about is having guidance from our grandmother from a young age. My grandmother's favorite saying is, let me show you. <laughs> Every time I visit her, she'd tell me, let me show you. Let me show you how to do something. And we were very fortunate enough to be her hands and her legs 
and have her direct us yeah. as she over us and guide us through medicine preparation, medicine gathering. And the greatest thing we got from her, I think, is uh, her ability, to, she just believes that just because it's the way that she does it doesn't mean it's the best way. So she always gives us the opportunity to take her tools or to create our own, our own methods of processing. But what did I learn from that? The greatest takeaway is my granny knows the best way. <laughs> Um, one way to explain those toxins about the Devil's Club berry is if you look at high brush cranberry, uh, we call it dulls. Um, they say it on the same uh, your the Western let's say medicine. They would say it's toxic; it shouldn't be eaten. And then you go look at it and get taught by someone. You just have to boil it down. So their toxic effects was gas. <laughs> so they they classify it as poisonous because it gives you gas which in my mind, working with plants, what did that gas do to alleviate in your body? So it gives me a door to open to go research at the same time. Um, I've eaten so much high brush cranberries without boiling it, and I probably got a stomach ache. <laughs> no, we used to eat it lots as kids. Right yeah, the and then you go, yeah, so when I'm, I have so many different reference books. If you look at this as my newest one, I just got that. That forest, this is a forest we live in. So all these, um, ha I so happen to know over half of these plants in here. And then I cross-reference with different, different books like that. I probably have four different books that I'm going off. And I cross-reference, take what I need and leave what I'll never use. Awesome. <clears throat> well, we were supposed to do um, a group bingo. I don't know if everyone had a chance to check out the Highs Love Bingo I shared on our group page. I think we're going to end the end of this gathering. Um, maybe we can play the, it was just for fun bingo. It was just like a Highs Love Bingo with Highs Love isms, you know, things that we might have in common as Highs Love people. And, you can find that bingo sheet on our High Slip Yellow Learners Group uh, Facebook page. I just wanted to quickly show and share what um, what the pictures of these plants look like. So that's Asina, the gray current. Good. And then I was trying to look up one for Devil's Club just to show the berries and then the big leaves. So we'll start seeing the berries probably a little closer towards the end of summer, but Devil's Club is sprouting right now. And then this is the bingo card I was sharing or talking about. As you can see, like I said, it's just for fun. So under the B, um, you can check off things that you were seeing. So there's examples like say, I, or you, you've um, eaten uh, soap berries, us, or you've made soap berries. So yeah, there's, there's some really fun, fun things we could probably connect. connect. Lots of presents. Yeah. <laughs> Hold at the Heisla Tug of War. All you need collecting when you read that one. <laughs> or dabbing that one. So we can play that next time if you guys like. Um, but thank you all for joining us again today. I have recorded this session. I'm uncertain of how long we'll keep up the recorded session for. Um, because these are really kind of, you know, I, I find that they're really still intimate gatherings with a lot of information being shared. So I don't want them out there publicly too long um, because there are some really Again, thank you for joining us. We'll be meeting back in the same way uh, on Monday from 3 to 4.30 p.m. If you have any suggestions tips or anything you'd like for us to share, if there's something that we're missing that you came here for, please let us know. Uh, we're, we're trying to keep in mind that you know, we have lots of learners out there who want to learn different things. So if there's something we didn't get to, uh, feel free to send me a message on Facebook. Um, or on my work email, which is simply twinsor at heisler.ca. Um, 
Oh, sorry. I don't know why I'm cutting here. It might be. Not it, quite sure why oh, it keeps. Cuts out a lot when everybody has their. Um... Oh. Sorry. <laughs> I'm trying to mute everyone and I accidentally did it as Corina was talking. Sorry. Um, but yeah, there is interference when uh, your, your um, microphone isn't muted. So if you just yeah. want to check the, the top right corner of your screen, there should be an option there to mute. It would be a nice practice for everybody to mute and unmute every time they talk so that we don't have interference from everybody else. Okay, I'll include that in like a list of like just some, I guess, housekeeping rules or or whatever for the gathering so that we're that we don't run into these these little minor issues. But thank you, and we'll we'll work on troubleshooting those little things like that. So thank you guys for your participation. I hope you guys enjoy the rest of your day. Ex everyone. Bye.